Um, so I'm, I think, the wrap-up speaker here, and I have the most boring subject to talk to you about of all. So you've had your lunch, and, uh, and now I'm going to talk to you about regulations. So I'm sorry if I'm going to put you to sleep, and I'm also going to commit the cardinal uh, flaw with PowerPoint presentations, lots of uninteresting slides. So we'll see how many of you hang in there. I'm going to start with an infomercial, which is about Maynock culture and who we are. Um, we have 190 commercial farms in the state of Maine. We grow shellfish, finfish, sea vegetables. Um, we have both land-based and ocean-based farms. And we now also have a relatively large aquaponics uh, facility, which is under construction now. And I think will be, when it's finished, will be the third largest aquapon aquaponics facility in the country. Um, we have experienced a fairly significant amount of growth over the last 20 and even as recently as 10 years. And that's the reason I think in part I'm here to speak to you is to talk to you about why we've had that growth and what lessons can be learned at a national level from that. So um, we have roughly uh, 300 new farms in the state in the last uh, five to eight years. Um, mm. The value of our uh, sector has tripled in the last 15 years in terms of its economic impact. And um, we have had roughly 30% growth in the acreage uh, in the state in the last five years. Um, so we're going through a fairly significant growth period. All of our farms except for one is owned by a family, uh, and that one is a seaweed uh, farm. It's, uh, it's a seaweed farm that has raised some capital on the market through stockholders. But every other of our farms is a family-owned farm, even our biggest uh, farms. Let's see if I can make this work. Okay, so this is the backdrop for us nationally. I think those of you who are in the sector know this, but the reason I put it up here is because this is the comparison between our sector and other protein groups domestically. We grow a relatively small percentage of the seafood that is consumed in this country domestically. And so when I look at that slide, I view that as uh, both a negative in the sense that we're obviously behind, but I also view it as an opportunity, as a positive. That space to the right, that all that dark space that is not being grown in this country is an opportunity for us to serve that market. It's currently being served by product, as you've heard already, uh, grown overseas. So let's look at the annual growth rate uh, nationally and compare it to the international growth rate. And these numbers are a little out of date, um, but essentially aquaculture, as some of you probably know, is the fastest growing food production method in the world. It's been growing roughly 8% per year annually on a global basis. There are different numbers, some a little higher, some a little lower, but that's, that's the, kind of the average number you hear. Uh, aquaculture in the United States has grown roughly over the last 20 years around 1%, but in recent years we've been contracting, and that's largely been driven by contraction in the CAFR sector. Um, and so uh, actually the, the total uh, economic value of aquaculture in the country has gone a little down, not up, uh, in the last few years. So I want to challenge you to think about this in a slightly different way than you've heard uh, before. Um, I, I, we focus a lot on biology, we focus a lot on environmental impact, we focus a lot on um, research. I want you to think about aquaculture in terms of economic development because the countries that we are competing against and the countries that have bigger sectors than our sector do precisely that. They view it as an economic development tool. And uh, they are very premeditated about how they go about that, and that shapes their national policy and the kinds of programs that they put in place to develop the sector. And that's really what I want to focus on today. It's not complicated, and it's not rocket science. Um, it's actually pretty simple. It's really about establishing a set of conditions that give consumers confidence, and most importantly, give investors confidence to risk capital. So in the States, we've really lagged behind growth rates internationally, but we have the largest EEZ in the world. We have one of the largest and most diverse coastlines and marine ecosystems in the world. We are the second or third largest seafood market in the world, depending on whose numbers you believe in. And we have very significant freshwater resources. So why are we so far behind? 
why aren't we accelerating more rapidly? And I really think it boils down to two simple things. Barriers to entry and operating costs. And regulations have an impact uh, on both of those, but I want to make sure I leave you with one message very clearly. Industry is not opposed to regulation. On the contrary, uh, regulations are important to us for a number of reasons, not the least of which is well-constructed and enforced regulations prevent the emergence of irresponsible operators that do bad things that hurt the entire sector. So regulations can be a good thing, but they have to be smart, they have to be practical, and they have to be based on science in order to be effective. In order to have a sector grow, you have to establish a business climate where the investors are confident about uh, and, and which allows them to invest. So there are things that are out of control of government um, that establish business climates. What's the opportunity cost for capital in the marketplace? What are interest rates? Um, what are the competitive uh, forces out there in the business world? Those are typically things that governments don't have a tremendous amount of ability uh, to influence. Market demand, you obviously need market demand. You need a demand for the product that you're proposing to grow. If there's no demand, it doesn't matter how much investment you make, uh, it, it will not be profitable. And you need available resources, obviously, as part of the equation. You need stuff, whatever that stuff is, that is used as the input into your production uh, function. So governments and regulations certainly have an impact. Uh, they, they predominantly, I think, uh, impact the business climate and, and the opportunities to get into a sector. But they're not the only thing that impact whether a sector takes off or not. These are kind of the, I would say, the core management components, if you will, of um, how economic development is stimulated, either by government or by non-government entities, whichever. So you need sites, right? You need to be able to get on sites. You need some financing options, and financing options are often dictated by commercial markets, not necessarily by government programs, but if you look at the early days of the Norwegian salmon industry, as an example, or the early days of the shrimp industry in some of the other countries that it's developed, you will see that government financing played a very important role in the startup of those sectors. Didn't, didn't play a continuing role once those sectors began to get up and running, the commercial financial community became more important, but in the early days, government financing is important. You need a certain minimum of infrastructure, and as an example of that, I'll, I'll say on the coastal plain, if you will, in the United States of America, access to commercial wharfs is a real issue. Working waterfronts are shrinking. They are being displaced by residential development. And uh, if you can't get your product back off the water over a commercial wharf, it doesn't matter what you grow, you're going to have a problem. So infrastructure is important. Workforce is important. Anybody who's an employer in this room knows that workforce is a challenge in this day and age. It's hard to find people uh, who are well qualified and capable, and aquaculture can be a pretty technical sector. Risk management tools is something that the traditional terrestrial agricultural community has benefited from for over 100 years, and USDA has played a very critical role in risk management tools. Risk management tools are especially important to aqu the aquaculture sector and growing that sector because, number one, it's a risky business. Our production cycle tends to be longer. So if you're growing something for three years, your risk is higher than if you're growing something for six months. And particularly for new farmers, farmers that don't have a financial buffer, um, if they don't have some risk management tools, a single crop failure may be the end of that business. And so risk management tools are very important. Regulatory clarity and stability, and this is really what I'm here to talk to you a little bit about today, and I'll talk a little bit more on that. And then consistent and economic juvenile supply is also a really important piece to the development for the aquaculture sector. If you look at any country in the world that started the sector from nothing, they typically had government hatchery and breeding programs that were the beginning of those sectors. That eventually gets taken over by the commercial sector. The commercial sector moves in, capitalizes those programs, builds their own hatcheries, builds their own breeding and selection programs. But again, in the early days of those sectors, government breeding and uh, uh, hatchery programs are very important. So, 
this is the, the terror slide that I put up there um, oops, for people who believe that we are not regulated. Um, that is the list of either acts or authorities, depending on what you grow and where you grow it, that have some ability to impact your business. And um, it's a moving target. It, it, it changes quite frequently, and uh, oftentimes there could be conflicting requirements between agencies or acts. Um, I want to just shout out to Michael Rubino and the work that he's doing that's a parallel work to what CARE just presented on, which is this regulatory, is it the regulatory streamlining? The regulatory task force. Thank you, Michael. The regulatory task force. Um, I think that that work is going to prove to be very, very important um, as we go forward here from the private sector to figure out how we have regulations which are uh, perhaps more nimble and more effective um, without being barriers to the development of the sector. And I'm, I'm hopeful that that work will not only uh, document what we currently are dealing with, but will also make recommendations in terms of how uh, duplicity can be eliminated and how uh, permitting and, and licensing can be streamlined. So, oops, I went the wrong way, sorry guys. Okay, so I'm gonna give you three examples of what I think are uh, examples of either a lack of regulatory clarity or a um, case of regulatory instability. And the reason that regulatory instability is important is because when investors look at investing in a sector, if they feel like the regulations are gonna change during that investment cycle, in other words, if the goalposts are gonna move, that makes them less likely to invest in that sector. And I would argue that in part, that's been part of the history of aquaculture in the US as we've, we've suffered from the moving goalpost phenomenon. So first example, and this is an example of perhaps regulatory clarity, not uh, stability, is aquatic animal health in this country. We have three agencies that assert authority over aquatic animal health, USDA, US Fish and Wildlife Service, and NOAA Fisheries. Um, and depending on what you're growing, where you're growing it, how you're growing it, um, you may have to comply with one, two, or even in some cases three of those, um, those requirements. Um, th those agencies have signed an MOU amongst themselves, and I think uh, the frustration from the private sector, and this will be no news to anybody from those agencies in this room, is that essentially that MOU historically has said we're gonna do what, we're, what we've been doing. Um, it hasn't really clarified um, or eliminated overlaps of authority. So I would argue that that's been a problem for us from the uh, private sector. And it's been a problem in two ways. One is um, we have currently no national program on aquatic animal health. And as a result of that, that impacts the private sector two ways. One is if you are in the business of exporting something to another country, um, that country will come back to you and say, you don't have a national aquatic animal health program, and therefore we don't trust uh, the safety of your product, and we're gonna ask you to inspect at a higher level than we would normally. So it increases costs from an inspection verification point of view. The other impact of not having a national program is uh, for interstate commerce at least, with the exception of Fish and Wildlife and Title 50, uh, interstate commerce is essentially effectively regulated by the states, and so each state has their own set of regulations. And if you're in a business which exports to multiple states, you may have to comply with multiple states', states different regulations. And so that makes it, again, very expensive. Um, if you, any of you know Bill Kelleher, who runs Kennebec River Biosciences, his business is based on providing health certificates to people who are shipping stuff between states, and he will tell you at length that um, he has a single staff person that does nothing but track the rules and regulations on a state-by-state -state basis on an annual basis because it's a moving target they all they're all moving and changing and so he's he's expending literally tens of thousands of dollars just to keep up to speed with, with those regulatory changes so that's an example of regulatory clarity and how that could be challenging to the private sector regulatory stability i would argue a, a possible example of it, we don't know whether this is in fact going to be the case or not, but if you're in the finfish world, um, you have to get an NPDES permit. And if you're in the marine environment uh, and you're thinking about potentially operating in federal waters, um, there are some suggestions for federal legislation that would suggest that there may be permits or leases or licenses 
that are going to be issued by NOAA Fisheries or Department of Commerce. Um, and then uh, there are also requirements for NPDES permits. And the question is, if the NPDES permits have a set of conditions on them that are designed to protect the environment, uh, will NOAA impose additional environmental restrictions, or does the NPDES permit conditions satisfy what NOAA needs? So we don't know uh, what that is. I, I have a great deal of faith in Michael and his team at the agency. I suggest that they will, they will probably make some good practical choices, but they may not be the people who make that decision. It may be Congress that makes that decision, and Congress may be told to impose additional requirements on those permits that are either duplicative or in some cases more extreme than the NPDES permits that we would normally comply with from a fishery point of view. And then the final example of regulatory instability is the, probably the classic one that anybody who's been around for a while remembers is the organic standards, right? So some of us worked on organic standards for 18 years uh, and we still don't have a set of, of organic standards nationally. We've had at least two recommendations from the NOSB board to the National Organics Program. Um, and we've had, to my knowledge, and I'm probably not in the know, is my guess, but I think we've had at least three different rule versions internally um, that have been written and rewritten depending on what administration was in power and what their proclivities were to organic standards for aquaculture or not, and we still have no rule. What does that mean to us as a private sector? That means that we are competing against product which is certified as organic, in other countries, and that's roughly about 1% of the seafood market in the United States of America. R roughly 2% of food in general is, is organic, and that's climbing. Roughly 1% of seafood consumed in the US is certified under some sort of organic standard. Those organic standards, many of them, are nowhere near as close to the strict standards that were being proposed in the US. In fact, they're significantly lax compared to the US standards. But what that means is domestic growers are competing against product in the marketplace that is labeled as organic that may in fact be less organic than what they are actually growing with no standard in the United States. And I'll give you an example. In the state of Maine, we haven't used antibiotics for five years in our salmon industry, okay? Under European standards for organic standards, you can use antibiotics twice before you harvest that fish and put it on the market as certified as organic. So that's a concrete example of the kinds of uh, competition, com competitive disadvantage we are at. So those are three examples of either lack of clarity or, or instability. And there are, I think, many, many more. I could uh, certainly poll colleagues of mine, and they would certainly have plenty of stories to, to tell about this kind of stuff. Why does this matter? This is work that Carol Engel and, and her colleague, Jonathan Manseton, did, and it shows the cost of some of these regulations, and in particular, I just want to draw your attention to the, the, fish, the fish health component. So this is for the U.S. salmonid producing uh, um, industry, and essentially what Carol and Jonathan found, and, and Carol, you correct me if I'm interpreting this wrong, but roughly 7% of the regulatory cost in that sector is to do with fish health regulations. Now, there will be a cost associated with fish health inspection and certification, and that's a legitimate cost, right? That's, we want to be inspected, we want to be certified. But the fact that there are three agencies that are involved in this space, probably in most cases in Salmon, it's two, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and then the state agencies would be the third group of agencies. Um, that drives costs up. Uh, ironically, USDA is the competent authority under the OIE International Treaty, and uh, I will tell you from my perspective, um, we need to have one program in this country, it needs to be in USDA, and uh, that's the program that needs to regulate farmed aquatic animals in this country, and the other programs are important to protect uh, wildlife, but they should not regulate uh, farm product. Okay. So I've talked a lot about regulations, but regulations are only a part of the development equation. And that's the, probably, if I leave you with one message, that's the message I want to leave you with. Regulations are important, but all they do is tell you what you can do. They don't help you necessarily do it. 
And so if you look at the development plans in other countries, uh, regulations are important, but there's a whole slew of other things that they do to stimulate development in that sector. And those are areas that we really are behind on in this country. So I want to propose, and this is not a new idea, I've been whining about this for a bunch of years, and I'm going to keep whining about it. I want to propose that we need a national aquatic animal, a, a national aquaculture economic development plan. The other one right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting excited about this, Bill. Um, so I, I think we just need to model it on what other countries have done. Uh, this isn't rocket science, as I said earlier. I think uh, it's obviously, from a structural point of view, it's got to be a public-private partnership. There needs to be connection between the private sector and the public agencies. Um, I would argue that um, it, it needs to be multi-agency. Ag and commerce need to lead it. This sounds starting to sound familiar, guys, to the uh, the structure of the committee. But I would argue that um, the the program itself has to be at the secretary level, and you need an industry advisory committee that reports directly to the secretary of agriculture and the secretary of commerce around the implementation of this plan. It has to include specific goals and timelines. It has to include assigned responsibilities. That is literally who in what agency does what, not this agency is gonna do this. Um, and it also needs to uh, assign resources, and obviously that's gonna involve Congress, right? You need, you need resources in order to implement something like this. It has to have a regular assessment schedule. In other words, you need to examine how you're doing every five years or so, and that in, needs to include metrics. What are the metrics that we use to determine whether or not this plan, this program is being effective. Is it number of jobs? Is it number of companies? Is it acres? Uh, is it pr <coughs> pounds produced? And then it probably needs a scientific and an economic advisory board um, so that the folks who are administering this plan, and particularly maybe um, the secretaries, can turn to those boards for advice on specific issues. So maybe an aquatic animal health issue, maybe uh, a financing issue, what have you. That's the structure. These are the core components. It needs to include investment incentives. Um, we need, if we're going to prioritize aquaculture, as Kerr uh, read uh, from the 1980 Aquaculture uh, Act, we need to provide in investment incentives to the financial community, just like we do to other sectors that we're prioritizing. We provide in investment incentives to uh, high-tech uh, manufacturing, provided investment incentives to a lot of different sectors within the economy. We need to do the same thing for aquaculture. It needs to have risk management programs. It needs to have programs that give investors confidence that if they take a risk and they fail, there's a chance for them to continue to survive and reinvest. It needs financing mechanisms which are specific to aquaculture. There are some unique challenges from a financing point of view for aquaculture operations, not the least of which, as I said earlier, the length of the production time. It needs to include training programs, and I'll get back to training programs in a moment, and then as I've alluded to earlier, it needs to include a national broodstock and hatchery program that provides for individual species at the early stages of that species development reasonably priced juveniles and establishes a broodstock program that selects for performance and disease resistance within that species. That's something that a startup sector cannot afford to capitalize, and we've got great examples around the world where that kind of a program has really jump-started um, a, sp a particular species. So I believe that if we put forward a national development plan, and we actually capitalized it, and we gave people the tools they need to operationalize it, that we could, by 2030, have this vision, if you will. We could have uh, an industry, particularly in the marine environment, that has some security of tenure. We could have certainly more regulatory clarity and stability. I think we could have strong but non-duplicative regulations. Again, I want to say we need regulations, but we've got to figure out a way for them to not duplicate each other. Obviously, we'd have a plan, but I believe we'd also have significant number of new startups. And we're going to have species and production method diversity because of the environments that we have in the United States. We have a very diverse set of environments. Why do I believe this? 
because that's exactly what we did in Maine. Ten years ago, we came out with an economic development plan in Maine, and it had all the components that I outlined for you in that plan. And I credit that plan for the growth that we are going through right now in Maine. It was a collaborative project between the state and the private sector, but it was the private sector that drove it. It was us that organized it, financed it, organized the experts that we brought in to advise us, but the state was a full partner in it, and, um, and it resulted in surprisingly few regulatory changes, but some very dramatic investments in programs that then have supported the development of the sector. Both that we are going through right now, if you look at the people who are starting businesses in Maine, who are starting new farms, roughly 60% of those people went through a training program in the last uh, 10 years or so. And I think that's really uh, tells a lot. Now that's training program for people who want to start businesses. It's not a training program for workers on farms. And there's a big difference between those two things. And what we are now doing is we've just done a workforce needs assessment in uh, Maine, looking at the aquaculture sector. And we're now um, designing worker training programs as a supplement to our entrepreneurial training programs because we need more workers. We need workers who know what they're doing and who aren't going to make the mistakes that we made as farmers when we started. Uh, you know, they say you have to kill a million fish before you become a, or an oyster, or a million oysters before you become a, a successful farmer. I, I would prefer to have that learning curve be a little shorter than the million mark. I think that would, uh, that would be helpful. So I'm going to stop there um, and just say this. 50 years ago, we put a man on the moon. We did that with a 25-year development cycle. If we can put a man on the moon, we can damn well grow the sector in the United States of America, and we ought to do it. Thank you.